Like Lionel before them, Bachman knew it needed a good line of accessories to sell its trains. After all, how long can you watch a train go around in circles? Needless to say, there were no shortages of these accessories available, especially in the early part of the company's history. Here's one of my personal favorites, the log unloader and loader. And yes, that's right, this can actually reload logs, which is actually a unique feature by itself, as the like flight variation of this could only unload them. As I mentioned before, running these old models for the first time in so many years brought back a lot of great memories, so I decided to recreate one. I would often have my layout set up with a lifelike logging mill at one point in the layout, and then at a point further away I'd have a Bachman log dumper. I'd use the mill to load the car and the Bachman log dumper to unload it. I like this because it always mimicked the real thing and gave the actual railroad line, be it a model, a reason to exist, that is to say, the logs were picked up from the mill and then dropped off at the unloader, giving the train a whole reason to exist. An interesting note, the F9 chassis system locomotive you're looking at is actually one of my original models from when I was a kid, still running as good as new without any modifications or major work. Its later model production pancake motor drive unit, built somewhere in the early 90s, I want to say before, sometime just at or just before 1992. As we can see, it was a little testy, but with some perseverance, I did finally get those logs to dump. And now let's take a look at another accessory, one of Bachman's more famous ones, the operating caboose. Unfortunately, from what I've seen and what I understand, it was famous for, well, having erratic performance, something typical of the time. If you don't believe me, well, just take a look at these shots. The problem oh. stems from having to get the flag hang out just far enough for the minifigure inside the caboose to grab without actually knocking it off by anything else, as you saw the locomotive doing the job for me. In the end, I went up to resorting to using the old school push technique. With success, as you see. And here's another fun little accessory Bachman came up with. It's the Action Depot. Basically, that little forklift you see is designed to pop out when the locomotive and train passes by. The way it works is actually pretty interesting. Let's get her out of the box and see how she works. Again, I know this is sacrilege to unpackage something like this that has been kept in such a pristine condition for years, but I submit to all the collectors out there that if these trains were meant to sit around, they wouldn't be made to move to begin with. Inside the box, we find, of course, the station, the forklift, all set to go, as well as two very unusual sensors. I'll explain how all of this works in just a moment as I set everything up here for a test run. Everything seemed okay, but then I ran into another unfortunate surprise. The forklift guy wasn't actually attached to the platform he's supposed to pop out on. I hadn't noticed at this point, but he had actually fallen out when I had taken it out of the box. Apparently the old glue just could not deal with being in 30 years plus storage, and just decided to give up the ghost and let go of the forklift. Luckily I did eventually discover him, and promptly reattached him using crazy glue. And after giving the forklift a chance to dry in place on the platform I just re-glued him to, I was ready to give this unit a test run.
So that's essentially the Action Depot, and as you can probably guess, it's a pretty simplistic creation here, although it's still nonetheless pretty interesting to look at. What it is, if we take a look underneath the hood, or the roof, because this is not a car, it's in fact a building, and I am going to free camera this because I'm going to have to get in for some close-up shots here, so please pardon my sloppy camera work. If we remove the hood, or lid, we can see inside that this is essentially a forklift on a very basic mechanism tied up into here with two sensors which are weight sensors on either side of the track so they're creating a block so whenever this is pressed down it comes out it's powered by another two set of wires set, set of wires that come out of this building and get run out of the station I should say and run over to the transformer here connected through the AC terminal and that's essentially how this thing is powered it's very basic again the frame comes down through it and the guy comes out with his forklift train leaves comes back in. Very simplistic, but still somewhat interesting to look at, I have to say. The one thing that kind of stinks is that these doors don't stay clo don't close after he's been opened the first time. I don't know exactly what happened here. These are supposed to, I guess, retract somehow, but they don't seem to work right. Not sure what's going on there. At any rate, I am glad I was able to finally get this working. It's actually very simple to set up. You simply put each weight, these come in the box, each of these sensors on either side of the station, and as soon as the train passes by them, it automatically opens up. The guy comes out and pushes the cargo out, and then once the train clears the second one, he goes back in. So again, it's down, he it comes out, it's up, he it goes back in. Once the train passes, I should say. And that's basically what is really is to it, unless a very nice little accessory for Bachman to put out there. Just would have been nice to have, a, have some instructions on it, but I'm glad I was able to get it together and make it work for this video. And let's move on to our next accessory, and oh, what's this? There's a reasonable facsimile of a 1970s station wagon done in HO scale stuck on the tracks. Help! I've completely run out of gas on my reasonable facsimile of an American's 1970s station wagon on the tracks, and there's a train coming! Never fear, I'll save you with my reasonable facsimile of a 1970s tow truck, done in silver and in Bachman HO scale. Hey, what's with the stupid huge hand on the shot? Uh, pay no attention to that. Uh, it's really me doing the, doing the work with my tow truck. <laughs> Hurry up before that train turns us into a reasonable facsimile of a shish kebab. Not to worry, sir. There you are, sir. Safe and sound. Thank you so much! You're welcome, young man. And you too, sir. Hey, Danny, can we stop for a reasonable facsimile of a milkshake? No! What about a hamburger? No! Junior, you know very well why we can't get fast food in this town. Uh, why is that again? Well, you see, the cheap guy who built this town was too cheap to buy the $10 kit to build a hamburger joint, because apparently, eating hamburgers is frowned upon in this town! Uh, you might want to take a reasonable facsimile of a chill pill before I hit you with a not-so-reasonable facsimile of a lawsuit, pal. Now, despite that, at least in my humble opinion, very nicely put together little animation there, this particular railroad crossing isn't anything really fancy, despite all the hype that the package kind of put together on it. As we can see, if we take a better look, there is a wire, as we see, that protrudes from the crossing itself that goes right to this track right here. And then if we go to the opposite side of the loop, right about over there, I believe I put it, yep, right there, we see there's an insulator. Essentially, you probably, those of you who are experienced in the audience have figured this out, most likely, but I'll tell those for anyone who hasn't or isn't familiar with this sort of type of model railroading and with using DC current, etc. What this is is basically nothing more than a basic block. That is to say that this particular section of track between those two points is isolated when this lever is pulled back, right over here. So when the station wagon is blocking the track, the circuit is cut off. And just to show you, I'll get my chassis system engine started up again. Good old reliable chess. He never failed me since I was a child. Still runs great to this day. See, right there it comes to a halt. Because now I'm on the block section from that insulator all the way up to where this wire is right over here. So as long as the station wagon is blocking this point, there is no power going to the track. Now, when I set this up to have the tow truck push into it, and again, that is kind of pokey on this, it doesn't always work, and luckily it did that time, but once you push these two together and then separate them away from the track, as, as I say, once you get the station wagon away, and sometimes it doesn't work, I'm going to give this thing a, just a gentle cl push to click it together. There we go. Now I'm going to push this forward, the power is restored, and the train starts to run again, as we see, but admittedly slowly. And that's essentially all this really is, although it is a pretty nifty little thing, I have to say. Not bad for, I think it was 14 bucks I bought this back in a hobby shop in Queens when I was still going to college in New York City. 
But nonetheless, uh, nice little touch, touch for what it was back in the day, especially considering the rough technology that Bachman had to work with. And incidentally, in case anyone happens to stumble upon one of these or is looking for one, it's called the Disaster Railroad Crossing. And to give you a break from all that un bearable excitement, let's take a look at something more mundane. In this case, a tra lit train station. Bakken made two of these, a red-roofed freight station and a green-roofed passenger station. Both of them were illuminated by a light that simply plugged into the accessory terminal of the transformer. The concept of these train stations is pretty basic, but think about it. What would a train layout or train set be without train stations? Here we have two of the freight depots in use. One of them is actually orig an original one from my childhood, while the other one was just brand new and pulled out of the box in this particular example, although I somehow managed to lose the footage from that. And here we have the passenger station I mentioned just before. Pretty much the same concept, the main difference being it's green and it has Sunnyvale written on the front, which apparently is a very popular town because, well, that's the only name that came on these units. But I guess if you had the Action Depot plus the Freight Depot plus this one, you could technically have three different towns in your layout, although one was technically for freight only. Again, while this is well made, the detailing isn't anything great. We do have the chimney, as you see, packaged in its plastic bag there on the left. As again, this is a factory fresh box that I just taken it out of. And we have the wires for the actual light bulb installed inside on the right there, dangling out. It's kind of, they're kind of hard to spot. We, of course, have the usual forklift, which seems obligatory from Bachman, mounted in the front to remind you, I guess, of the Action Depot you could buy with one that actually moves, albeit just in and out of the depot itself. Essentially, this is made from the same frame, as far as I can tell, as the Action Depot and the other stations, just with some slight modifications to get more economies of scale, if you will, for Bachman. And here's a shot of the back of the depot. Again, not very much detail-rich, to put it mildly, if you will, except for the open windows, which is a nice little touch to differentiate it from the front of the building. And now let's move on to another of my favorite accessories, the Placer EM80C geometry and track cleaning car. This unique little car is unfortunately known for being ridiculously unreliable, so I wasn't expecting much from this boxed example I did buy, apparently from a closed hobby shop, especially considering all the issues I've had with pancake motor drives, as unfortunately this particular car has one of those as well. And it's known for failures. But anyway, I decided to give her a whirl and open her up. Inside we find a completely undisturbed instruction manual as well as a parts diagram and a warranty statement. The uh, <coughs> warranty statement being very necessary for an engine of this era. Too bad it's not valid anymore. As well as the usual information on how to lubricate and maintain this track cleaning car. And now let's take a look at this beast, if you will. It took a little work to get it out, apparently. The locomotive was reluctant to see the light of day after so many years of sitting in storage. Once I did finally get the track cleaning car out of the styrofoam packaging, I was greeted with an unwanted surprise. The front cow catcher that goes on the front there actually came loose, mm, apparently, from all the years good. of storage. And then again, I guess it's a lot to ask any adhesive to hold. Luckily, some crazy not glue fixed well. this. Still, it was not a very good omen for a start. In fact, I had so little confidence that this track cleaning car would actually work, I didn't even bother, as you can see in the background, getting down the actual full-on layout I've been using and have purposely built for this particular project. Nonetheless, I had spent the money to buy this track cleaning car, I might as well test it out, the utilization of some power lock track across my bed instead of the actual layout. To get this track cleaning car ready to well clean tracks, we need to simply remove the two air conditioning units located under, above the cab on the right front end, I believe that is, right there. These two units cover up the fill point for the reservoir for the track cleaning fluid, which will be dispensed as the unit moves along the tracks, oh. or at least should. <sighs> Yeah. Paint, luckily, not plastic, Turning. that came off as I pulled those two plugs off the roof of the unit itself. 
Next, I need to fill that reservoir covered by the two plugs up with some track cleaning fluid, and I'm going to be using the sort of old standard that I used for this unit when I first got one back in 1994, and that is this lifelike track cleaning fluid. I thought Walters had discontinued this, but apparently they're still making it under the name. Pretty simple here, just carefully pour it in, and remember, less is more. With the locomotive topped up and ready to run, it was time to give her a try, and I was pretty stunned with the results, and in a good way. Now, for those of you not familiar with this track cleaning car, it is known to have major motor issues right out of the box, mainly with the commutator causing it to whine, screech, and make all kinds of other charming noises. Most of you who fix pancake motors will be aware of what I'm talking about. Whatever the case, for this unit to run this well out of the box without any kind of work whatsoever is stunning. It ran so well, in fact, I decided I was feeling a bit on the lucky side and would try something beyond insane for this type of model. Now you can imagine my shock when I turned the power on and this engine actually started to move on its own power so well. Usually you get these and they have commutator wine or they have track gears, etc. But again, this just started working. So since I have this little bit of track cleaning to do, I figured I'd put it on analog power and see how she does. It's going to take a while for it to get through the tunnel. I have it set to a low power output. I'm trying not to put strain on the motor. As you put, I guess for those of you who don't know, running a DCC, DC on DCC is a no-no. Pardon the rough camera work. I was not expecting this to actually happen. Let me increase my wattage a little bit here so it goes a little bit better. There we go. Around Whitestone Mountain. I can't overthrottle. And that brush drags this thing like crazy is what, my, is what the uh, first person, I'd, when I was a kid, I got my first one of these told me about. So I don't want to push this too hard. I'm just going to let it run one more time around the, around the top loop here, which needs a cleaning. And then I'm going to call it quits. Okay, there we go, around there. I'm going to overthrottle these. I'll strip the gears on it. She's coming across the ladder. I am absolutely stunned that this thing works, works well, in a good way. Because I finally got a little good luck out of this project, considering how many mishaps I've had so far with equipment. Oh, well, it gets stuck there, I know that much. It actually give us a little bit of help. It's the brush bottoming out on that on that switch, which is the problem. These are, again, made for Bachman-style switches. So that's why on that one it works okay, although not perfect. So, yeah, it actually works. There is That is a complete shock. I'll be dipped. I was not expecting that to happen, period. See, I can even probably go the other way now. Ooh, I think I hit something there. No, it looks okay. Now I'm starting to hear the time you take a little bit. That is beyond unbelievable, and in a very good way for a change. I am stunned. Anyway, let me take this off the tracks before it causes any damage to anything. And in case you're wondering, yep, that's dirt that I've taken off the tracks. As you can see, it did its job, and quite well, I might add. That's, yeah, that's stunning. In a good way, for a change. I am very happy with that. Very, very, very happy. Clean my tracks, and it worked. Now I promise I'll probably want another one. <laughs> oh, boy. Because I am to really like this model. All right, looks like I'm going to be shopping for another one of these. Now let's move on to the crane car and boom car slash floodlight car as there were two configurations, one a boom car, one a floodlight car. The unique feature of this particular crane car is that you could not only move the hook up and down with the rope obviously, but also adjust the rake of the arm assembly. Now I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, wow, that's really cool. Men really outdid themselves with this product. Well, make no mistake about it, this was not an original idea. This is again from the Kadar era, and of course Kadar was producing trains for Lionel for that for a period of time. As we can see from this 1970s catalog, essentially all Kadar did was reinitiate production of a model that was taken out of production when the partnership between Lionel and Kadar had ended. Nonetheless, there were some minor enhancements done to this particular model, including having an extra place to put the actual crank knob assembly thing when you're actually not using it so it wouldn't fall out as easy, but make no mistake, these little knobs get lost all the time. I'm speaking of that little black knob sticking out of the side of the actual crane itself. 
This is again another boxed example which I picked up as I could not find mine. I'd had at least one or two of these back in the day. I have no idea where they are. I know I had one out in more recent times. I, for the life of me, could not find either one of those. I went ahead and just bought this one off of eBay. As we see, this is the boom car version, but it does still have the instructions, strangely enough, to put the actual light bulb in on the floodlight car variant. This car, again, while it's the exact same car, it just has two wooden planks sort of over where the hole for the floodlight would actually go. With the car successfully railed on the track, it's time to give her a whirl. And to do that, we simply take this little round plug knob thing and plug it into the second notch from the end to adjust the rake of the actual crane arm itself. A nice feature of this crane is that Bachman thoughtfully enough put this little slot at the end there, which will hold the, hold the knob in place when not in use. Putting the knob into the first slot and turning it will allow us to move the hook up and down, as we see. Another interesting feature of this crane is it can be actually swung 360 degrees all the way around. I should also note that this particular crane car is actually still in production, albeit under the Silver Series brand. The main difference being is it now sports metal sprung knuckle couplers and metal wheels. Still, it noticeably updates it and makes the crane much more reliable in terms of getting around sharp curves, etc. And now I'd like to move on to a few of the items I was unable to acquire for this portion of the documentary. This was mainly because either A, they were too expensive to get hold of if they were available, B, they weren't available, or C, they were simply too fragile and too difficult to make functional. That pretty much describes the Bascule Bridge to a T. This particular bridge was, has always been very much in demand. To this day, you still will pay over up to $100 to get a hold of something resembling a good used example. I just didn't have, again, the space to set this up and work with it, even if I was going to acquire it, so I decided to leave it out. And they are hard to get in anything resembling good working order. Essentially, you pull up to the, the uh, bridge with the train, the bell goes off, and the bridge, bridge raises. The train power to the top is automatically cut. Pretty unique, nonetheless, for what it is. And what 1970s-era model railroad company would be complete without a railroad crossing? The particular unit on top here on this particular catalog page is particularly unique, as it has a flashing lights on both, of the gar on both of the crossing guard gates, as well as a bell, which apparently comes from the little hut on the, on the side there. Again, I was unable to locate one of these in operating condition, and pretty much any of those that you'll find are probably pretty much destroyed due to how the plastics tend to act from this era. Here are two more interesting accessories. The blinking bridge, I actually had a few of these as a kid, one in particular in my 1989 layout, my first sort of major 4x8 layout that we had up for Christmas. I love this thing with the blinking light on it. Unfortunately, my, my trestle never was completely finished, but I still loved running the train halfway up and down. Below it we have, of course, the cattle crossing accessory. I've never actually been able to find one of these. The next two items can be classified as noisemakers. Let's remember that these trains did not have sounds back in the day, with the exception of the noisy motors. The talking station, which was little more than a station with an amplifier and a microphone, and the shell gas tank, which essentially had a diesel horn in it. You press the button and it made noise. I actually did have one of these tanks at one point, but I've not been able to find it, and I think it broke toward the end of its life. And again, another noisemaker. We have the steam whistle station. Again, we have that sort of operating depot on the top up there. And on the base of this particular page, we see the obligatory model railroad tunnel, which pretty much every model railroad provider at that point had to have. Lifelike kind of got the whole thing started, and well, pretty much it pretty much became an industry standard to offer some sort of tunnel with your particular trains. In fact, it pretty much became obligatory, at least in the 1980s, to have at least one tunnel on your layout that looks something like this. And finally, we have an oil storage tank with a flashing light, which pretty much sums up what it is. And, in addition to all the other accessories I have featured in this part of my documentary on Bachman trains, there was an extensive range of just plain building kits and already assembled kits, signposts, etc. I found these for the most part difficult to come by as the older brittle plastic tends to make these items more prone to breaking, and particularly the telephone poles and signal bridges which were known for breaking before they got old. 
And that's going to do it for the accessories portion of this documentary. Before I go, I'd like to again give credit to HOSeeker.net and all the contributors there. If it wasn't for all this information, I couldn't do this documentary and many of the other features I've done here. So thank you again to them and as much credit as I can possibly give. Again, not sponsored, but if you are looking for resources and finding parts, etc., this is a great place to go. Check them out at HOSeeker.net. And as always, if you like this documentary, give it a thumbs up. If not a thumbs down, don't forget to subscribe. And as always, keep the metal side down.